Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Cure with the CWA. Uh, this is Friday the 14th, if we need to remember. Panel number 5511, America's Unchanging Relationship with Russia. It is an apt title being that 69 years ago, Howard Higman did start the Conference on World Affairs precisely because of McCarthyism and America's unchanging relationship with Russia. Um, just a quick note, uh, please silence your cell phones and please uh, submit questions via the CWA app just as we've been doing in other sessions throughout this week. And as we leave the auditorium, ushers will have donation envelopes if you are so inspired to do, but most importantly, thank you for your support. And without further ado, sir. Hi. Thank you for being here and for coming today. Uh, I'm Sarah wilson Soki. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science here at the University of Colorado. And I'm very interested to moderate and, and help host this panel today because my own area of expertise is Russian politics. And so I agree, uh, Russian politics is all, it's always an interesting time to study, but uh, our relations with Russia are now um, particularly salient and, and important. Um, so we'll have opening statements by our four panelists today, which will run about 10 minutes uh, per panelist. And then we'll open it up to questions and hopefully have lots of time for, for lots of good questions, which I'm sure there will be uh, a lot of engagement and questions to ask our four panelists. Their full biographies, of course, are in the program. And so just briefly to introduce who we have today, um, we have with us Robert Kaufman the Doxson Professor of Public Policy at Pepperdine University, and the author of his recent book, Dangerous Doctrines, How Obama's Grand Strategy Weakened America. And uh, Professor Kaufman will also be joining us at the University of Colorado next year as the conservative chair, uh, the chair in conservative thought next year. Uh, we also have Joe Cirincioni, uh, who is the president of Plowshares Fund, the author of Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It's Too Late. Uh, I have been told that you should Google Nuclear Colbert, and this will uh, lead to a, uh, a popular media appearance on Stephen Colbert. Um, a former member of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, and also the International Security Advisory Board, and so has done work and prepared studies relevant to Russia, and I'm sure will have very interesting comments to share with us today. We also have Bill Marmon, who is the managing editor at the European Un uh, Institute, uh, and has let me know before this panel that uh, his first trip to Russia was in 1971, um, and uh, has gone about half a dozen times to Russia since then, uh, and that first trip was a very auspicious one. He went with a woman who was not then his wife, but is now his wife. Um, so it was a good association with Russia. Um, and then finally, we have A. Edward Elmendorf, a past president at the United Nations Association and a former diplomat at the United Nations. And this means that we will, I, I am certain, have a, a full range of perspectives on America's unchanging or changing relationship with Russia. Uh, so without further ado, I will go ahead and we'll start with Robert Kaufman. We'll make the first statements. We're going in the order listed on the program uh, today for this event. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here on a nice Friday afternoon. I, uh, as usual, reject the premise of the panel. We have had a changing relationship with Russia, and I, I think we're in the middle of yet another change. Uh, for the past eight years, uh, prior to Donald Trump becoming president, President Obama pursued a very logical um, intellectually coherent policy of trying to engage Russia as a partner for peace, uh, not only in Europe, but in the Middle East, assuming that we had more in common than what divided us. That policy, I argued in my recent book, was fatally flawed and undermined uh, American security, not because it was, wasn't logical, but because it was based on a false premise that the increasingly authoritarian nature of the Russian regime did not have profound implications for reviving Russian expansionism, inimical to the legitimate interests of its neighbors, uh, 
all of our NATO allies and the United States. So I believe that the Trump administration began initially, despite all the rhetoric, sharing Obama's premise that the internal characteristic of the Russian regime wasn't a critical variable for how we should engage it. Uh, it appears that we are evolving in the other direction based on events of recent days, and I believe that the, the idea of the Trump administration belatedly treating Russia as a strategic adversary uh, is actually uh, correct. Uh, I'll explain why. In, 19, in 2005, speaking publicly to his own legislature, Vladimir Putin said that the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the demise of the Soviet Union. Uh, I think that is a remarkable and disturbing statement and a key to understanding um, Putin's ambitions, which it is in our vital interest and well within our capabilities to resist. Uh, imagine if Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, said today or at any time in the 21st century, the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was May 9, 1945, the demise of the Third Reich. Uh, we would not treat that person as a partner for peace, but as an adversary. Uh, as Gary Kasparov in the book Winter is Coming and Elon Berman in the book Implosion eloquently argue, as Senator McCain has argued stalwartly and I think correctly, uh, Putin's ambition is uh, nothing less than to reverse the outcome of the Cold War. Uh, the good news is that he does not have an animating messianic ideology justifying it. Uh, the good news is that in many ways Putin is playing a relatively weak hand deftly. Uh, this is not the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War in terms of its power potential. The GDP of the United States alone exceeds Russia's by a factor of eight. Add to that the NATO GDPs and NATO collectively with the United States has a GDP in excess to Russia's of 16 to 1. So it is well within our capability to frustrate Putin's ambitions and deter him and to put pressure on Russia to reform this corrupt, increasingly authoritarian, static regime. Uh, as Elon Berman points out very cogently in his 2012 book, Implosion, uh, in many ways, Russia's basket case shielded from our realization of it because of the artificially high prices of energy, which I think are destined to come down. Uh, the Russian economy is stagnant. Uh, more Russians want to leave than stay. Uh, emigration is at record level. Uh, Russia is demographically declining. According to Nicholas Emberstadt, one of the foremost demographers of Russia, Russia is now on the path of having a population shrink to less than 100 million people by 2050. Uh, the average age of Russian males has declined to 58 years. Um, it's even worse when you look at the distribution of this demographic decline. The area that's been keeping the Russian economy afloat is Siberia, and Siberia is literally depopulating, that's the area rich in natural resources, and Siberia faces a powerful, resurgent China with irredentist claims to that region. The only segments of the population growing in Russia, comparatively speaking, are the largely radical Islamic populations on Russia's periphery. You may not know it, there are more Muslims now in Moscow than in Paris. You can't understand Putin's gambit to try to incorporate Ukraine into the Russian imperialism without understanding his ambition to use Ukraine as the vehicle for reversing the outcome of the Cold War and simultaneously to stave off 
Russian decline. If you add the 48 million Ukrainians of Slavic origin plus 10 million Belarusians to the Russian Imperium, you have at least a plausible answer to this inexorable demographic decline of Russia that is occurring with Russia with its current authoritarian regime in its current geographic configuration. As Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski point out, Russia without Ukraine is a regional menace. Russia with Ukraine has a plausible chance to reverse the outcome of the Cold War unless we robustly deter it and clearly understand what Russian intentions are. Uh, Donald Trump seemed at the beginning uh, n no more clear on this than President Obama's ill-advised reset. Uh, we seem to be moving in the other direction for a variety of reasons with the Trump administration's strike on Syria, one of Russia's clients, uh, having implications more broadly that will result, I believe, in a more robust American response to Russian imperial am ambitions in Europe. The first and foremost thing that we can do to minimize the risk of Putin's Russia is to thwart his ambitions to dominate Ukraine. We have a moral as well as geopolitical interest in doing this. Start with the moral interest. This is an issue where ideals and self-interest coincide. No people in Europe has suffered as much from various forms of Russian oppression as Ukraine. During the 1930s, to cite the most notorious example to hold the more, Stalin's collectivization of Ukrainian agriculture killed, murdered, starved between five and nine million people. It's very understandable why Ukraine wants to be part of the West rather than Putin's authoritarian imperium. Also, uh, Ukraine added to the West would deny Russia the resources, the demographics, to make plausible their bid to restore some Soviet or Russian empire in East Central Europe. What should we do then? One, end the reset. Two, understand Putin is an adversary rather than a partner, not only in Europe, but also in the Middle East where he enables Iran and Syria. Three, arm Ukraine. Four, impose biting rather than tepid sanctions on the Russian banking and energy sectors where it really hurts. Five, significantly bolster American presence militarily in Poland and the Baltics, our Eastern European NATO allies terrified that they may be the next victims of Putin's ambitions unless we wake up. Six, reverse President Obama's improvident decision not to deploy missile defense in Poland and the Czech Republic in the forlorn hope that that would make Putin a partner for peace. Seven, rip up the START Treaty, which favors Russia, allowing them to build up, forcing us to build down while impeding ballistic missile defense. And finally, overall, the United States can do more than anything to deter Putin's ambitions and force Russia to reform or implode rather than expand by rejuvenating the American military badly depleted by Obama's shrinkage and by Trump abandoning his improvident rhetoric, which he seems to have begun to do. NATO, for all its limitations, is a vital vehicle as it was from the beginning, to quote Lord Ismay, the first commander of NATO, to keep the Americans in Europe to keep the Russians out of Europe, and to keep a democratic Germany anchored in the West rather than allow it to be the loose cannon of Europe. So I should let you know you're right Europe in about German. 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. On that note. So I have the unenviable task of cutting off very interesting comments sometimes. Um, but thank you very much uh, for that.
And next we have Joe Serencioni, and I also failed to mention, we'll be on Rachel Maddow tonight uh, as well. But he will be commenting next. <laughs> thank you very much, thank you. Uh, this is my last panel for this uh, conference, and I just want to thank all of you for coming and for allowing me to come. It's been a real pleasure to come back to CWA. And, uh, and if you haven't gotten enough, I'll be uh, on the Rachel Maddow show tonight. We're going to be talking about North Korea. And then again with uh, Joy Reid on MSNBC tomorrow morning around uh, probably 8 o'clock uh, Mountain Time. But let's go, let's go back to Russia. Much to my surprise, and I hope for the last time, let me say that I agree with Robert Kaufman. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with everything in the first half of his presentation. He, start, he, he characterized it exactly right. Putin is playing a poor hand deftly. This is not the Soviet Union. This is not the great power that we contended with across the globe. This is not a country with a massive military alliance. They're not, they don't have dozens of Soviet tank divisions within range of, uh, of NATO borders. They're not backing uh, a network of, of, of communist parties around the world or fueling insurgencies throughout the world. And neither are we against them. This is not a struggle for global domination. It's not even close. But it is still a very, very serious threat. And, and Russia is weak for all the reasons Robert uh, detailed. Um, recently, just in the last, while we've been here in, in, at the conference, a number of people have, have raised up uh, Mitt Romney's comment in the 2012 debate, where he said that Russia was our number one geopolitical foe. And Obama pounced on that and denounced it. Many people like I, me, did, we disagreed with it. The uh, New York Times editorialized about it. But I have to say, in hindsight, he was right. He was right. Because there were parts of the Russian power, there were parts of the Russian operation that we did not fully appreciate at the time or had yet to manifest themselves. And most importantly, are there cyber capabilities, which we now have been learning about in great detail, both during the presidential election and after, and their strategy for how to disrupt what they see as our agenda, how to disrupt our alliances, how to disrupt our system of democracy as a model for the world. You know, in some ways, it's, 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 it doesn't matter that much to them if Donald Trump is a friend to Putin or not. What they wanted to do was to credit, discredit the American system. And as a recent witness in Senate testimony explained, one of the reasons that this, the Russian message that democracy is a rigged system, is a phony system, works so well is that Donald Trump kept repeating this charge. He picked up the Russian claims, a lot of the fake news reports, and he repeated them. So he validated them. So they got a lot of what they wanted in the election. The fact that Donald Trump was elected was just icing on the cake. And they all celebrated both their victory and what they thought would be a now a new era of friendly relations between the U.S. and Russia, and it appeared that that is what, in fact, Donald Trump wanted. It's not at all clear that the current hostile state, the current hot state between the United States and Russia, the adversarial relationship is planned by Donald Trump as much as it's happened. It's, it's happened. And this brings us to the one area more than the cyber, more than the fake news, more than the network of, um, of, of surrogate par uh, affiliated parties that he's developing throughout Western Europe, the far right stoking the popular nation. The, the number one existential threat that Russia represents to us is, of course, their nuclear arsenal. Even though they were no longer a, a, a a global superpower, they are still a nuclear superpower. Even though they used to have, during the height of the Cold War, 35,000 nuclear weapons, and so did we. Together, we hold 95% of all the nuclear weapons in the world. Because of largely Republican presidents, 
those arsenals have come down step by step. Ronald Reagan, H.W. Bush, W. Bush, and now Obama have negotiated treaties that have brought those levels down to about 7,000 on each side. About 4,000 on each side are in what they call active stockpiles ready to use. And the really scary part is that each side has about 1,000 on, on missiles on, on high alert or hair trigger alert ready to launch within minutes of a decision to do so. So Donald Trump can call over the officer that follows him around constantly within a minute of reaching the president, and he can tell him he wants to launch a nuclear strike, he can open up that suitcase and he can give the order, and four minutes later the missiles will be flying. He doesn't need anybody else's authority, nobody can stop him, and nobody can call back the missiles. And Putin can do the same thing. As Richard Nixon said, I could go into my office, pick up the phone, and in 30 minutes, 70 million people would be dead. So when we talk about this, it's not just an abstract, what's the great power relationship? What's the use of force in the relationship? It's, it's, there there is, are planetary consequences to a miscalculation, to a false step, to a conflict getting out of control. And this is why you have to pay attention to this. It's not just about the fate of democracy, not just about the fate of Western, the Western alliance, not just about the fate of the people in Ukraine. The arsenals of the United States and Russia could destroy everything humankind has built over the millennia in an hour. So, could this really happen, or is it just this Somebody said, they, every time they come and hear me talk, they get scared. Good. Then you're in touch with reality. And this is a reality we don't talk about much. It's distant. You don't see it. Our silos are in the plains, the great plains of America. Our submarines are under the ocean. You don't see this stuff, but it's there. It's very real. It's a phone call away. Here's the scenario that worries me the most outside of North Korea. During the whole Cold War, I'm I was just trying to think, I'm not sure there was ever a time where U.S. and Russian troops were, came into direct combat with each other. Or there, was a, there must have been, but I can't remember it offhand. Maybe some of my panelists can. But in Syria, we could. We just moved 500 combat troops into Syria, unannounced. The Trump administration has stopped the practice of announcing our troop deployments. It's said that M McMaster, has a, the head of the National Security Council, has a plan to um, put once, or an option of putting thousands of more combat troops, not special ops, combat troops. That means that our troops are now a grenade throw away from Syrian troops and Russian troops. If we strike Syria again, and Russia has told us just yesterday, just two days ago, this, the foreign minister Lavrov told our Secretary of State Tillerson, don't do that again. Huh. And the administration has said, if Assad drops a barrel bomb, we will retaliate against him. So last month, Assad dropped 450 barrel bombs. I, I said on the state, 12,000 over the last year. I said 20,000 yesterday, it was only 12. What makes you think he's not going to do that again? If we retaliate, what happens then? Do the Syrians then shell our combat troops? Do they attack us, our troops on the ground? Do we respond back? In responding back, do we kill Russians? If we kill Russians, what happens next? You can see how this could quickly escalate. Up in Turkey, about 100 kilometers from the Syrian border, we have one of our seven depots in Europe storing nuclear weapons. We have about 50 B-61 bombs. These are designed for battlefield use. They're, they're so-called dialer yields, so you could make them be very small, uh, still 10, 20 times bigger than the Moab, the bomb we dropped on, uh, on Afghanistan yesterday, but, but for battlefield use. Russia has a policy now of, uh, that would include their possible use of nuclear weapons in a conventional combat that they were losing. So the nuclear threshold is shrinking. The, it, it, or the gap between conventional war and the possible use of nuclear weapons is shrinking in the doctrines of both the U.S. and Russia right now. So you could see how this is a very real-world scenario that could escalate into this kind of, of conflict with Russia, 
possibly going nuclear. Is this probable? No, it is not probable. Is it, there's a non-zero possibility of it happening, and for me, that is way too much likelihood. That is way too much likelihood. So as we do and concentrate on everything we can on what we actually do day to day, week to week with Russia, we have to keep our eye on this long-term goal. We've got to reduce the arsenals of both these countries, get these weapons off of head trigger alert, put some circuit breakers into that command and control mechanism so one man can't order the, the, the destruction of the entire planet. That is an unacceptably dangerous posture. We cannot allow these postures in both the U.S. and Russia to continue. These are the kinds of things we have to keep working on, even as we struggle with the day-to-day, month-to-month relations. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. And so next, we'll move to Bill Marmon. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad it is, it is Friday in my eighth panel. Uh, it's been a fantastic experience, my very first at CWA, uh, but I won't forget it uh, anytime soon, let me tell you. Now, the, 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 the subject here, uh, Russian-American relations, it's a huge and complicated subject. And I thought that for the purposes of this panel, I would focus on one very important aspect of this relationship, and that is the U.S. policy toward Ukraine, which uh, Professor Kaufman has mentioned. And I wanted to start off by, by, by uh, letting you know that uh, Donald Trump was not the only presidential candidate whose campaign was boosted by officials from a former Soviet bloc country. The Ukrainian government tried very hard to assist Hillary Clinton to undermine Trump during the campaign. They disseminated documents that implicated a top Trump aide, Paul Manafort, in corruption and suggested they were investigating the manner they backed away from that later after Trump was elected. Anyway, the Ukrainian efforts did have an impact on the race, no question. It helped force Manafort's resignation and advanced the narrative that Trump's campaign was deeply connected to Ukraine's foe in the East, Russia. So, um, I think it's important that, that we refocus the attention away from these campaign uh, narratives to, to something that is more important and, and substantial. And, and, and one of these important and substantial issues is the Ukraine. Now, what's, what, what are we talking about here? Well, um, most immediately, we're talking about the invasion of, of the Ukraine uh, in 2013 and 2014 by Russia and Russia's supported uh, uh, forces and the formal annexation of Crimea, which was a part, of, part of the territorial uh, area of Ukraine, the first such annexation since uh, in Europe since 1945. The, new, the world order as we had come to know it since World War II had been changed and been threatened. Now at the time of the takeover in 2014, President Obama called the Russian aggression in Ukraine one of the three most important issues in the world, along with the ISIS threat and Ebola. Now today, Ebola, thankfully, is off that list, but Ukraine is not. And we have to realize that in this 21st century, Vladimir Putin is playing by 19th century rules. Now, should America care? Some people say, well, Ukraine is far away and, and, in, and should be within the the uh, sphere of, uh, of Russia. Well, let's explore this. I'm not, we, we've, we've heard some, some fairly definite uh, views on this from Professor Kaufman. I'm going to be a little bit more circumspect than he was. But we need, first need to say, we need, need to explore what the American policy is toward Ukraine. And since uh, assuming the presidency, the world has tried to figure this out. And, Trump's contradictory statements have confused everybody. They've created, one, created an incredible anxiety in Kiev, Ukraine capital. Trump had said that he wanted to pursue more cooperation, particularly on Syria and counterterrorism with, the, with Russia. But his administration has said out of the same voice that, that, uh, that cooperation uh, 
uh, is, 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 is going to be more difficult. And President, uh, Vice President Mike Pence and Secretary of State James Mattis, and UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, have emphasized the threat that is posed by the threat Kremlin. So we need, to, uh, we need to watch and see how Trump is going to evolve uh, toward, toward this very important issue of Ukraine. But in, in evaluating what is a sensible Ukraine policy, it's understanding, it's important to understand the bases for the Russian position. Now there is a close historical relationship between Ukraine and Russia. A large ethnic Russian population and even larger Russian speaking population. The ethnic Russians are concentrated in the eastern part of the country. In, in Donetsk and Crimea, more than 50% of the population identifies as Russian as its native language. Of course, in Western Ukraine, the percentage of native Russian speakers is, is much less. Although almost all Ukrainians do speak Russian fluently. And the languages of Ukrainian and Russian, while similar, are distinct. They sometimes compared to the relationship between Spanish and Portuguese. Now, I want to go back briefly to the 17th and 18th century, which is when most of Ukraine was absorbed into the Russian Empire. There was a brief period of independence of Ukraine in 1918 when Ukraine uh, declared independence from the Russian Republic. But for a long time, Ukraine has been part of Russia. And in 1922, Ukraine and Russia were two of the founding members of the Soviet Union. And as Professor Kaufman pointed out, relations between Ukraine and Russia were permanently strained in the 1932-33 famine called the Holodomor, death by famine, orchestrated by Stalin, where some eight million Ukrainians died. In a full-length movie on this period, A Bitter Harvest was recently re re released. It wasn't a very good movie, but it was a great, uh, a great uh, propaganda uh, piece. Anyway, the Berlin Wall fell in 1998, uh, 1989, excuse me, and communist governments in the Eastern Bloc countries and the Soviet Union rapidly unraveled. Soviet Union in itself ceased to exist in 1991 when the 14 entities of the Soviet Union, including Ukraine, Georgia, and the Baltic countries of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, became independent. And as, again, as, as uh, Professor Kaufman had pointed out, Putin made his famous speech in Munich saying, above all, we should acknowledge that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the major geopolitical disaster of the century. And uh, Russian discomfort and humiliation was increased as NATO expanded to the east against the counsel of some, including George Kennan. In 1999, three members of the old Warsaw Pact were taken into NATO, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. And in 2004, seven more Central Eastern European countries were admitted into NATO, including the Baltic countries of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Estonia and Latvia are on the Soviet border. And Lithuania sits between Belarus and the Soviet enclave of Kaliningrad. Then in the 2000 and 2002, time period, there was a serious discussion about bringing Ukraine into NATO. But Germany opposed it, and it didn't happen. At the same time that NATO was expanding, so was the European Union. And in 2004, eight former Soviet bloc countries and Soviet Union countries joined the EU, and several others came in later to complete the complement of 28 countries in the EU today, before we have the Brexit which will reduce it to 27. In 2013, Ukraine was on the verge of signing an association agreement with the EU. And that was widely seen as a precursor to full membership in the EU. But then in November 2013, President uh, Viktor Yanukovych shocked Europe and many US and many Ukrainians when he refused to go through with the deal. And this sparked the Maidan riots in Kiev and elsewhere which led to the violence, which turned violent when government snipers started using live ammunition to kill hundreds of their fellow citizens. And in February 2015, 2014 actually, Yanukovych fled Kiev and was subsequently impeached legally, illegally according to the Russians. And the Russian populations in Crimea and Ukraine viewed the overthrow of Yanukovych with some alarm. 
The alarm was heightened by an early and ill-advised act by the new parliament just after the flight of Yanukovych to make Ukrainian the sole state language of Ukraine. Now, this act was subsequently uh, vetoed and never went into effect, but it did, it, the damage was done. Crimea is an island-like mass jutting into the Black Sea, and a full-scale revolt commenced there against the new government in Kiev and encouraged and supported by the Russian troops, but it didn't take a lot of too much encouragement because it, with only 60 armed men, Crimea was able to drive out the uh, government forces and, and, and raise a Russian flag over the parliament and other government buildings. And uh, several weeks later in a referendum, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a referendum that uh, w one could, 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 could question the uh, bona fides of, but nevertheless, there was a referendum where they uh, voted in favor of leaving the Ukraine and, and going, uh, affiliating with Russia, which was, in two days later, the Russian Parliament Act to, to annex Crimea. Oh, I don't know if, the, there it is. I, I do. You are at about 10 minutes, so if you could wrap it okay, up, please, so will. we have enough time. For, I will. For I will. Anyway, Thank it's you. very important to understand this background before we go uh, uh, making policy toward Ukraine. We need to understand that there are significant Russian interests there that need to be uh, at least uh, recognized. Now, we shouldn't give Putin a pass for invading another country, but at the same time, we need to be sensitive to the fact that there are uh, that Ukraine is an important uh, neighbor and, 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 and historic part of, 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 of what uh, of Russia. We can we can talk about this later. Hey, thank you very much. So, in our final uh, speaker for today, Edward Elmendorf will provide our, our last set of opening statements. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll build on the others to the extent I can. As I think about <coughs> U.S.-Russian relations, uh, some characterizations that I would use, tensions, differences, some common interests, which have not been underscored, and some important values issues. The tensions are very apparent on Russia's periphery. We've talked about the Middle East. Uh, also in regard to the military, we have an issue in respect for past arms reduction treaties uh, and U.S. plans for a possible further arms buildup. Differences that we have, very pronounced on Russian promotion of Russian nationalism. We certainly heard about that today as a very serious issue. A, a strong orientation by the Russians towards sovereignty in the UN Security Council and beyond. Uh, we also see important differences underscored by uh, Professor Kaufman on uh, Russian demography and the general lack of dynamism of uh, Russian, the Russian economy and society. And you compare that with the United States with an incredibly dy dynamic e economy and a very active engagement around the world, that puts us in a very different position. But there are some common interests that merit uh, attention. Uh, above all, uh, avoiding general uh, war. Uh, we also have an important common interest in trade and investment, particularly in the field of energy. And we have an, a, a common interest uh, in the preservation of the veto in the UN Security Council, where the structure of uh, <coughs> the UN and international collaboration established by World War II uh, gives us both that privilege. Uh, very important values issues, however, do divide us and Russia, uh, particularly on uh, human rights, democratic values more generally, civil society, where there have been very significant restrictions on civil society uh, in recent years, uh, and of course, uh, concern about election interference and allegations of collusion uh, with the Trump campaign. 
so I would characterize uh, the current status of American relations with Russia as having a high level of uncertainty and unpredictability. Uh, yet, as we heard already, uh, the U.S. and Russia are the strongest military powers in the world, and we do share a common interest in reducing the risks of war from unpredictable action. I think many of you may be familiar with the uh, doomsday clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Early this year, the <coughs> bulletin moved that clock 30 seconds closer, uh, 30, minute, uh, 30 seconds closer to midnight, now only two and a half minutes. This is the closest to midnight that the bulletin's midnight, <coughs> that the bulletin's clock has had since 1953 when the U.S. and the USSR tested the H-bombs. So what should we be doing? Here I'm sensing much greater differences among the panelists than in the circumstances. In my view, we should take advantage of every opportunity that we have and can identify to deepen dialogue, both with the Russian authorities as well as with the Russian people. Now, obviously, they put some restrictions on this, but among other things, I think we should work very much doing whatever we can to strengthen Russian civil society uh, and to open up uh, radio communication. Uh, I think there's a desperate need and, and desire on the part of the people there to have independent sources of news. Uh, I think we should also be addressing corruption and crime uh, which are very serious issues in Russia and beyond, <coughs> instigated by Russia. Within the U.S., I think we should do whatever we can to reduce the factors leading uh, to unpredictability. Among other things, I think we should, uh, I'd like to see this Trump administration staffing the State Department. Uh, the, the Tillerson State Department thus far seems to be all but devoid of uh, senior officials. Finally, I think we need to get to the bottom of the issues of Russian interference and the question of collusion. In my view, uh, it would be highly desirable to have a fully independent commission uh, to look into this and as a byproduct to try to establish standards uh, at least for this country, that may be also applicable elsewhere eventually uh, to deal with this kind of phenomenon. Uh, we, we see it already in Western Europe, and the capacity clearly exists. It's something that is a major global issue for the future, and I think the U.S. could take the lead in establishing standards. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. So we've had four very interesting perspectives on uh, America's changing or unchanging relationship and a number of international issues. I've gotten great questions both from your note cards here and from the app, and please do keep submitting those as the uh, panelists here are responding to your questions. And what I've done is tried to group these questions into areas of questions so that I can cover as many as possible. Uh, for the panelists here. So several major themes emerged, including cooperation between the countries in the questions, I mean, several uh, important areas of questions emerged. Cooperation between the countries, the issue of Syria, Ukraine, Trump and Russia connections, um, Russian domestic sentiments, other questions about European politics, and some questions specific to nuclear issues. And so what I think would be best is actually if we start with that broadest question of cooperation between Russia and the U.S. because that is the theme of the panel and also there were a number of interesting questions about this. Uh, and so there were several uh, sort of sub-questions under the question of Russian and U.S. relations. One person asked about why the U.S. and Russia couldn't com uh, form some sort of supernation to fight ISIS and to achieve world peace. Um, a student submitted a question about, uh, in the same vein, really, um, but stated a bit differently about what are the opportunities to cooperate. Someone asked about how the U.S. and Russia could improve their relationship, that Russia, if we don't see Russia as just a global world evil, that if we wear the opportunities forward, war, where 
And there were other specific questions about space exploration and cooperation, and also uh, a Brexit was a question from a student about how that affected U.S.-Russian relations. But I think that general question, and probably directed um, directly to our, our last um, panelist to give opening statements here, Edward Elmendorf, but also to Robert Kaufman about opportunities for U.S.-Russian cooperation, just broadly, sort of what the possibilities are there. It sounds like several people are interested in that. I, I think we have to look at possibilities with a certain element of jaundice, and here's where I would agree uh, with Professor Kaufman. This is not just an automatic thing. We need to be very careful in assessing where we do, in fact, have common interests. We do need to keep in mind the famous Putin statement uh, in, in reference to the collapse of, of the Soviet Union. Uh, I, I, I see the greatest of possibilities in the field of arms control and to me that also implies being very, very careful about the further uh, expansion of uh, American military forces uh, within this country and, and beyond. Uh, I think I'll li limit my comments there. Thank you. Uh, I marinate in jaundice on this issue. I, I, I think it is a mistake and we tried it. Uh, Einstein's definition of insanity is doing the same thing again, expecting something different. And uh, this is a bipartisan criticism. It goes all the way back to a president I admire and have defended in print. George W. Bush, when he met Putin for the first time, saw Jesus in his eyes. John McCain quipped rightly, I see a trinity, all right, KGB. And, and that's what I see. Uh, it's, it's no accident that Garry Kasparov, the greatest chess player in history, uh, has written, uh, in many ways, the best book on Putin because Putin thinks strategically and at the risk of damaging my reputation and, and Joe's, um, despite our difference on the issue of nuclear uh, politics, we agree that Putin is playing a chess game and his goal is less to elect Trump or Hillary Clinton. His goal is to discredit and weaken American institutions and credibility everywhere, the Middle East, Europe, confidence in our own system uh, to further his ambitions. And, and finally, on Ukraine, a word. One, it's not the Ukraine, which implies it's a region, which uh, rigs the debate for the Russians. Uh, it's Ukraine. And remember, in 1994, and this is an issue I, I think Joe will be concerned about, if we want to minimize nuclear weapons, understand that Ukraine in 1994 voluntarily gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange for the promise and the pledge that there would be no annexation and no military annexation or change in borders. The U Ukraine, uh, I committed the same error, delivered. Russia did not. And not just on this issue, but as, as a signal for countries, the, the lesson on nuclear nonproliferation of this episode is don't give up your nuclear weapons, because if you do and things change, um, you lose. Would the other panelists like to respond as well? And we just, we had one question that just came up that's relevant about whether the United States could take advantage of its stronger economy vis-a-vis -vis Russia to get more cooperation with them, but maybe you'd like to offer a, another perspective. So I served on the International Security Advisory Board for the Secretary of State, first Clinton and then Kerry. And we were, I was part of a working group that was gonna talk about US-Russian relations. And we were all set to start the discussion when Putin invaded Ukraine with this hybrid warfare. It was unclear, remember, for months what was actually going on here. It's very, very hard to respond to. We weren't prepared for it. We're better prepared now. But our report then, and all of us felt the same way, Republicans and Democrats, it's, uh, it's very interesting when, you, when you, your, your task is to make a concrete recommendation to the Secretary of State. What exactly do we do? 
not what our posture is, not how, do we, how does this fit into our existing worldview, but what should the United States do? And we forged a, almost immediate unity. We said we have to stop business as usual. This is completely unacceptable. We have to stop all cooperations with the Russians. And then somebody said, well, what about the space program? Right. We rely on the Russians to get our supplies and even our astronauts up to the International Space Station. Okay, we have to do that. Uh, okay, what about the Arctic? Right. We're cooperating with the Russians to devise sort of, you know, rules of the road on, on, uh, on the, the Arctic, particularly as the climate changes and the Arctic starts to melt. Okay, we've got to write that in. That's, that's an exception. What about Iran? Right. They're part of the talks on Iran, and all during the Ukraine crisis, as tense as things got, it never filtered over into the Iran talks. The Russia was not only cooperating with the United States, but was extremely helpful in fashioning that, that, that final uh, uh, agreement. And it turns out there was a long list of scientific and technical, environmental, climate change where we're cooperating with the Russians, where you, for our own national security interest, you had to keep cooperating. So we narrowed it down to business deals. That's, we agreed, put sanctions on that stopped U.S. investment. And here's the tool. This is what you can use. This is one of our great powers. It's not necessarily our military threats to Russia. It is our economic threats. So we're withholding the kind of investment and cooperation they need, particularly in conjunction with the Europeans. So there are definitely things you can do, but there are also areas, even while you're contending with Russia, even while you're disagreeing, there are clearly areas where you have to keep that cooperation going for the pursuit of our greater uh, geopolitical national security issues. There's another interesting question that was submitted related to this, which was, how can Russia be such a major and threatening power, given that several of you had mentioned the demographic crisis or the problems with the economy or these other, these other issues? So the question being, I think, if I'm interpreting this correctly, sort of how is Russia really a threat if you're also saying that the country's dying off? Because that's how wars often occur. People or countries that fear long-term decline and see short-term opportunities uh, takes the Habsburg Empire's ultimatum uh, after the assassination of the Archduke in 1914, uh, Imperial Japan rolling the dice uh, in 1941, uh, Hitler was a man in a hurry. Look, uh, I want Russia to face the same type of moment it faced in the 1980s. Reform or implode rather than expand. In order to make that choice more likely, uh, the Russians have to confront a robust, confident West. And what has concerned me is, and this is bipartisan, uh, the Obama administration, and certainly the initial national security advisor, uh, Michael Flynn, who was unsuited by temperament and substance, and President Trump himself, seemed to operate under the, the false premise that Russia was a party that had more in common with us rather than a party that needed robust deterrence. So in fact, w what you cite, and I think it also applies to China, isn't a paradox at all that wars and dangerous conflicts m are most likely to occur with the dangerous convergence of short-term optimism and the fear of long-term decline. So let's, building on this, move on to talk about Ukraine, because there were several questions about Ukraine, and I think I'll direct these initially to Bill Marmon, uh, because you spent um, much of your opening statements talking about Ukraine. Um, there were several related questions. One is, why is the U.S. so opposed to Russia being in Crimea, given that historically it was part of the Russian Empire uh, and that there are ethnic Russians there wanting to rejoin? And then also some general questions about um, what are the resources in Ukraine that would really strengthen Russia? I, I'm interpreting this as sort of why does Russia really care about Crimea? Um, and a question from a student asking generally, why Ukraine is so particularly important for the region. Uh, and then general projections about uh, a question about will Russia really absorb Crimea and will Russia really absorb Ukraine uh, as a whole? Right, well, I'll be happy to take a crack at this. I'm not as, as much of an expert on this issue as my fellow panelists. 
But I do, I do I have been fascinated by Ukraine, and, and at the European Institute, we have covered uh, the uh, unfolding Ukrainian issue uh, quite extensively. And until Brexit came along, it was probably the most, one of the most important things that we were, were looking at, because uh, uh, from the point of view of the EU, uh, ha having, having a, a relation with, with, uh, with, with the Ukraine uh, was, was, was one of their real initiatives. And of course, it was that that, that sparked the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the Russian, you know, that was a bridge too far for, for, for the Russians. And, 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 uh, and that's what sparked the, uh, the invasion and, and, and retake of, 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 uh, of Crimea and, 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 and the uh, uh, agitation in the eastern provinces. You've got to realize that, that Ukraine, I mean, that, that, that Crimea, that there were already Russian forces in Crimea. There was a long-term military agreement between the Ukraine and Crimea uh, to station the, the headquarters of the Baltic, the, the, the Black Sea Fleet uh, out, of, out, of, uh, out, of, uh, out of Crimea. And, and there, were, there, were, there was a, 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 an agreement where Russia could, could have uh, military forces there and, and military aircraft. So it's just, it's just you know, it's not, it's, it's not sort of a Westphalian uh, issue here of, of, of one state invading another uh, in, in the way that, that, that many people in the West see it uh, on first blush. Now, uh, we, we, we have to stand up for the fact that, you know, uh, that you can't go invading other countries. However, uh, nobody, I don't think, is, is really expecting Russia to return Crimea. Uh, I, I, there, there are people on the right and the left who have said we got to, we got to, somehow cut a deal with with Russia on this. If Russia is willing to, 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 to cut a deal, uh, but uh, if they really want to take over the Baltics, uh, you know, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, who are members of NATO, you know, the, the, we can't cut a deal. But if they, if, 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 if they could, if they, there could be a deal that would, that would, that would say, okay, uh, Russia will get out of Eastern Ukraine, and we will, and Ukraine will never be a member of NATO, or not be a member of NATO, and not be a member of the EU, and uh, and and we'll we'll stop this irredentism in the in the Baltics. That's a conceivable sort of arrangement, but it's probably not possible right now because. Putin senses weakness in the West, and he's uh, he's got this populist uh, thing going in Europe. I mean, if, if Marine Le Pen, who was who was is, is is being sponsored by Russia, should win the French presidential election, I mean, Putin would be on a roll. And so, you know, I agree that we need to be tough uh, initially, but we need to recognize that uh, uh, we need to see we need to keep that off ramp. Uh, open. So related to this, there have been several questions about sanctions against Russia, which initially were imposed because of the intervention in Crimea. And so um, a couple of audience members have asked about a better alternative to punishing Russia than sanctions, something that would be more effective. But there's also been a question that sanctions potentially have some benefits to Russia's economy, like currency depreciation, and so that these sanctions are maybe not very effective. I don't know if any of the panelists could comment to the well, role one, of sanctions. Well, one, you need tough sanctions, but two, um, on NATO, um, I've heard uh, that NATO expansion provoked Russia. Uh, the great, in my view, heroes of NATO expansion are uh, Bill Clinton, Anthony Lake, um, and Hillary Clinton in her memoirs, who makes the very compelling point that uh, Russia in any configuration has never invaded a NATO country. And one of the things in your comments that makes the uh, Baltics different is that it is part of NATO. Imagine if the Baltics hadn't become a part of NATO. Uh, the Baltics would now be up for grabs uh, in a way that they are not. 
because of NATO expansion. Uh, NATO expansion, the consolidation of the democratic peace doesn't uh, pose any legitimate threat uh, to Russian interests. And, and as for Russian interests in Ukraine, uh, let's look at it from the Ukrainian perspective. To tell Ukrainians that they should be part of the Russian Imperium, given the experience of the Holodomor, is like telling Jewish refugees in 1946, go back to Nazi Germany. Ukrainians have a justifiable aversion to that. What we need are sanctions that bite. And what hurts Putin, sanctions on the banking and energy sector, uh, we need sterner sanctions, but sanctions alone never suffice. So let's move on to, there, another big issue is Syria in U.S.-Russian relations, obviously, and several of you mentioned the role of Syria, so I think that I'll direct this initially to Joe Serencioni and Edward Elmendorf uh, to respond to, but there were several related questions one is, does Russia just want warm water ports, and that's why they're interested in Syria? Um, was the U.S. bombing in, in Syria the right thing to do? And then a very pointed question um, about if any of the panelists believe Russia did not concur in the Syrian use of, of chemical weapons. But if uh, either Joe or Edward could speak a little bit more about Syria and its role. Uh, Russia is a country with very few allies. Belarus, Syria, that's pretty much it. They have uh, interest in selling things to Iran, but it's hard to call Iran an ally, except when it comes to Syria, where the, the Russians and the Iranians have been propping up the Assad regime. So it, Russian motivation for Syria was one, to keep that ally, two, to keep that naval base, it's the only warm water naval base they have, keep it on the, um, and to keep it as a, as a key player in the Middle East. It's in Putin's interest to, ex to re restore a, a Russian role in the Middle East, which has been sh shrinking steadily, particularly since the American invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. So they want back in. This is on their border, remember. This is their area. And they believe that, that the U.S. has no business being there and that they should be the, the dominant power in the region. So that's part, part of the geopolitical I impulses for, for Putin, um, as well as an opportunity. And this really is a little reminiscent of, of Hitler in the Spanish Civil War, the opportunity to demonstrate the effectiveness of, of, of Russian uh, military weaponry, the way Germany tested it out in, in the Spanish Civil War. And, this, and they're hoping that other countries will buy the, some of these weapons, that they're showing their effectiveness. Remember the cruise missile launches, for example, from a Ru Russian ballistic missile, from a, a, a Russian cruise missile submarine in the Black Sea on Syrian targets. Um, totally gratuitous, not necessary, but a great demonstration of, cap of capability. Uh, was, the Russia, was the US strike on on the, on the airfield justified. I actually think it was. I think if Obama was president, I think if Clinton was president, you probably would have seen the same kind of response. I mean, in many ways, it meets the criteria of what some call, sometimes called just intervention theory. It was proportional, if you believe that, Russia, that, that the Syrians were responsible for the chemical attack. It did not target civilians, you know, and it was warranted by the, by the circumstances. There was a real threat that it was answering. And it, so far, you have to give them credit. It, it has had a deterrent effect. It, ha, it ha, has seemed to stay Assad's hand, at least on this line, at least on the chemical weapons attack. So I would say that was proportional. The problem you have is what follows up. Where's, what happens next? And the fear is that Trump has kind of moved on from that. That was his demonstration of resolve, his demonstration of force. I'm a tough guy, look how effective I am. And he's now m moved on to other things. Or oh, it's part of a general buildup or increase in military operations in the Middle East, which some people will think is a demonstration in America's back, a demonstration of resolve, a demonstration of strength. That's the way we'll counter Russia. I believe this just leads to a, a risk of a much greater conflict that will spiral out of control, particularly because we have a president with an, an undiscernible, incoherent national security and foreign policy. 
Well, thank you. Uh, and Edward Elmendorf, would you like to comment as well? Uh, I, I'm, I'm left with a question on Syria. What have we accomplished with the bombing? I'm not at all sure. Right, right. Just go ahead. No, I'm that's it. Well, I, I think that's a fair question. So that's I mean. So the bombing can be effective. I mean, it it can be if it's followed up. So it's but it's a. I mean, reasonable people can dip, differ on this. But go ahead. But our problem is that we we lack any form of consistency and predictability in American policy. I think. Our, we, our problem of Russia at much th today is within this country as it is in Russia. Uh. You, you know, one thing on Syria, uh, I w with respect to U.S.-Russian uh, relations, I'm not sure how helpful it is for the uh, uh, for U.S. intelligence to to try so desperately to find a Russian connection to the to the Syrian. Uh, uh, chemical bombing. I mean, it'd be okay. There, there was a uh, there was a plane that flew over the area or something like that. But but uh, you know this this sort of uh, uh, desperate effort to to connect Russia to to the chemical bombing seems to be uh, uh, unnecessary unless unless there really is something there. Well, one, we need to have more of the intelligence declassified. I mean, it's not like. We, we're not listening in to the Russians. So we need to have more of the case, because I agree with you. The case that's presented publicly so far is not con convincing. It's not decisive. I suspect there was Russian at least knowledge of this. Perhaps, able. let's find out. And the reason people want to make the connection is, is because that we'd like to pressure Russia to restrain these attacks in the future. There's a feeling that Assad would not do this unless Russia acquiesced to it. So that's the key to stopping Assad from doing this, is to, is to convince Russia to stop him. So related to this, we've just heard a pointed criticism from Joe about the Trump administration and, there've been, uh, and, and foreign policy. And there have been a number of questions about the Trump-Russia connection. And so related to um, Trump receiving financing from Russian oligarchs and how that would affect U.S.-Russian relations, why Trump seemed to initially love Putin so much, although this maybe has changed recently, if there was collusion proven, what the consequences of that would be. Um, but I think that general question of, of what's going on with the Trump-Russian ties and, and policy. One, uh, I, I think the points of uh, criticizing President Trump's uh, initial outreach to Putin and the strategic confusion are, are well taken, and two, it's uh, still a work in progress or regress. But three, I, I do think there's a much more coherent trajectory in seeing Putin as an adversary that's less ad hoc uh, now that uh, General Mattis and uh, General McMaster are, are again, the uh, more dominant and reliable uh, figures in national security. Also, on the issue that, that you raise, you want to see more. I don't think that's fair, uh, especially in light of the uh, um, allegations that uh, Putin had Trump in his pocket. Imagine if Trump, uh, based on this Syrian episode, did nothing. People would be howling in the other direction. Aha! Uh, this is an example of uh, Putin having Trump in his pocket. And I, I don't think whether you agree with the policy or not um, that uh, Generals Mattis and McMaster uh, are involved in something where they don't believe, whether you do or not, that there was actionable evidence that the Russians at least knew and indeed may have been complicit and possibly enabling in Assad's use of chemical weapons. Would the other panelists like to take on this question as well, the Trump-Russia connection and its consequences? Yeah, uh, let, let, let me say that I, it seems to me that what we need to focus on is, is the Russian intervention in the election and, and, uh, uh, and how to, to and, and go, going forward, how to be more effective in, 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 in calling them out on this and, and, and combating the, the uh, the, the troll army that they have, and, and, and so forth. But, you know, and, unless, and again, and again, it's possible something really could come out, 
that, uh, that, that is, would be actionable with respect to the collusion between um, Trump and, and the Russians. It seems to me uh, we should f focus on the, the Russian uh, part of it rather than the Trump part, uh, 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 at least until we have some basis for, for, for doing otherwise. Let me respectfully disagree. While we've been here, we had news that the FBI was ordered surveillance, requested and was given grant, and granted permission to have surveil Carter Page because he was a Russian agent. So while we've been here, the, the information on the collusion with, between Russia and campaign officials has started to grow. The Paul Manafort funding from Russia, the financial arrangements with Russia are enormously damning uh, on this account. Much of the investigation that's going on, we, don't, we can't see, but a lot of the investigation that's going on is being done by print journalism. This may be the finest hour of print journalism that we've had in decades. People who are digging at the Washington Post, at the Washington Times, at the Wall Street Journal, digging on this, following the threads. I think this is the most profound political scandal we've had in this country's history. This is much more serious than Watergate. This is, is much more serious than anything alleged during the, the, the Clinton years. It, it, you know, and there were no scandals during the Obama years, so we've become kind of used to having scandal-free presidents. We've, but they're popping up on a daily basis with this administration. I, I do believe that this issue is going to cripple the Trump presidency, that all the, 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 the efforts to show strength are so resolved to take actions are, 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 going, to, are going to evaporate as the information comes out of the deep involvement that Trump campaign officials had with Russia, and yes, the cooperation, the sharing of information from WikiLeaks, the coordination of the release of that information, the repeating by Trump officials of the main fake news storylines coming out of, out of Putin's Moscow. This is gonna get a lot worse before it gets better. No, this is gonna get a lot worse, period. It's not gonna get better, it's not going away. So switching let, topics. Let, let uh, me but, just. Oh, uh, if you'd like one, to jump in, yes, because I'll switch to one something. One additional comment. I, I agree that the media are playing a very important role in this, but I think we we cannot rely exclusively on the media yeah. to come to the bottom of this, and I certainly don't think we can rely on the intelligence committees on Capitol Hill. So we end up with some kind of an independent commission. Well, well, you need a select committee. You, it's, it's, it's crying out for this. There's nothing, this is like the Warren Committee, this is like the 9-11 Commission. You need a select committee. There's a related question actually to this about fake news and whether or not fake news is harming or aiding the relationship between Russia and the U.S., which seems potentially related to this issue of Trump's ties to Russia. Um, would you, anyone like to briefly comment on, on the role of fake news uh, in U.S.-Russian relations? A absolutely. This is one of Putin's, this is the way he's playing as we can deftly. This is one of the things you could do. You see the mechanism that he's set up. You see the cooperation he's getting with these Western European white nationalist parties that, that have, have arisen. I mean, th and they, they repeat, they echo, they feed back into it. We now have a new generation of, in Western Europe, a new generation of Quislings. You remember Quislings. This was the Norwegian foreign minister Quisling who cooperated with the Nazis to, take, to, to have, help them occupy his own country. We now have in Western Europe, in, in Eastern Europe, we now have politicians cooperating with the Russians to, to help them uh, get to power. And fake news plays a huge part of this, this confusion, this distraction. Every time there's, a, there's, 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 a, there's an episode that runs counter to Russia's interest, runs counter to the interest of these white nationalist parties or the white nationalists, including the ones in the White House, you see these phony stories thrown up just to throw dust in people's eyes, to put a spanner in the works, and they're given equal treatment to the actual real scandals that are taking place. Thank you. So we've had... Uh, I, I just wanted to yes. push that a little bit further. I agree on the importance of the fake news. <laughs> but uh, what, what should be our response to this? It, it seems to me that we have an enormous interest in this country in strengthening 
the institutional capacity of the media, universities, and the like to get to the bottom of fake news and to reveal the fake character. Uh, I don't think this is an automatic thing. We should be looking at the implications of social media for facilitating fake news. And what do we do to combat that kind of thing? I, I, I'm personally quite convinced that this realm is a very important future issue of public policy in the country. Universities, bluntly, having spent my professional life, have problems about political correctness of their own, and they're the least likely vehicle to uh, clarify rather than confuse debate. Uh, any, any response to this, and by the way, we've dealt with this before, the Soviet Union engaged in active disinformation. Um, Joe's right about this, and in fact, it's not just fake news, it's, it's buying people off. The uh, former uh, German Chancellor uh, Schrader is on the payroll of, of Russian energy. Uh, uh, Italian officials are, are deeply implicated. Um, London real estate, Putin has used his media, his finances, uh, really to sow a fifth column in the West, and, and Joe is right about that, and the way is, uh, the issue is how do you combat that within the, within the, the firm strictures of the First Amendment, because people have a right to do this, but we need something, the, the equivalent of a Radio Free Europe, um, dealing with this to, to respond to pervasive Russian disinformation and subversion which is going on in Western Europe, and, and now it includes our electoral process. There's no doubt about that. 30 what seconds, 30 seconds. There's a role for civil society in this. It's not just what do we want the government to do. The, the Omidyar Foundation, so I'm, I'm in the philanthropic sphere here. The Omidyar Foundation just announced $100 million in grants that they're going to give to investigative journalism. So there are financial ways to strengthen the free press in our society, which is all, all of you know has been on, on rough times adopting to the internet age over the last 15 years. So there are things civil society can do independent of government action. So we'll go from one very Cold War sounding topic of fake news and Radio Free Europe and uh, what sounds like a, a very Cold War esque topic to another, which is nuclear issues. There were several pointed questions about nuclear issues. Um, one question involved um, a, a question about didn't President Nixon have some kind of two circuit breakers to intervene to make this a, a slightly, I, my interpretation of this question is to make it a safer um, system, that there were two circuit breakers. There was a question about whether there was a treaty with Russia to avoid this sort of um, nuclear trigger and missiles, and did Trump call that sad? Um, and then a, a question also about whether we should be worried about Russia not deploying nuclear missiles, uh, but deploying Iskander missiles in Kaliningrad and the development of new intermediate range cruise missiles. In order, Russia is violating the, the INF treaty. This is the treaty negotiated by Ronald Reagan that removed an entire class of missiles from Europe. You remember the last time relations were this bad was in the 1980s. This is when Plowshares Fund was founded, when the U.S. and Russia were, in, were going cheek and jowl with pouring nuclear missiles into Europe. Reagan took them all out, eliminated them. Russia's now violating that. They've introduced a new cruise missile that violates the limits of that, those treaties. Uh, uh, is, are there circuit breakers? No, there are no circuit breakers. The President of the United States has the sole authority to launch nuclear weapons. No one can legally over, overrule him. Once he gives the order, it has to be, be carried out, short of a full-scale mutiny. That's why you should put circuit breakers in here. That's why Senator Ed Markey and, and Congressman Ted Lieu have introduced a bill to require congressional authorization for the first use of a nuclear weapon not in response to an attack, but if we're going to use one first, Congress should have a role in this. If you agree with that, go to the Plowshares website, plowshares.org, help sign our petition. We have almost a half a million people endorsing this. We're going to do a, a press conference with Markey and Lou on, on May 3rd. What was the last one? Uh, I think you got them all. Okay, good. So one last, we have about a minute, and I think we have one good last closing question uh, as well which is some people ask about, are Russians really sort of culturally authoritarian? Do they really love Putin um, that much? Or, you know, is this also fake news? Or do they really love him? 
But the, uh, another related question was, is Russia responsible for the rise of nationalism in Europe? Is, is, that, is this a Russian influence that we were seeing some far-right parties, nationalist parties, is that a Russian um, you, influence? You trend? can't blame it exclusively on Russia, but uh, you can say that the Putin phenomenon uh, has been replicated across Europe. Look at the Polish Justice Party, look at the disturbing uh, trajectory of Viktor Orban's self-proclaimed illiberal democracy, and um, there is a resurgence of um, authoritarian nationalism, not, not just in Europe, but Ergodon in Turkey, who began as a parliamentarian, is moving in an increasingly Islamist authoritarian direction. There is a widespread greater frustration with the normal processes and messiness of democratic politics. And though I think that the, uh, the uh, comparisons between Trump and fascism are, are really outrageous, Trump is part of an international phenomenon and frustration that you have to take into account, especially if you don't agree with it, that there is a widespread dissatisfaction with democratic politics as usual. And people who defend that, and I'm one of them, have a job to do because uh, it is now a contested proposition, especially in Europe and the Middle East. Yeah, but in answer to your question, you know, I think that, uh, that we, we, we should not get too paranoid that Russia is the, is the source of all this. There's got to be a more much deeper and, and, and uh, uh, you know, complex cause of this phenomenon. It's not just somehow some sort of plot for the Russians. Great, well thank you very much for this very interesting panel.